Good afternoon. My name is Dale Medeiros. I'm an environmental planner here with the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. And it's my pleasure, along with my colleague Corey Miles, to welcome Jonathan Muller, the senior architect of Pflanzen Systeme, based in Ludwigs, Germany, for the first of a series of webinars that NVRC is organizing on ways in which ideas, creative innovations from across the United States, but also in other pioneering cities and countries like Germany, um, could be shared to help us with our own resiliency initiatives here in Northern Virginia. Um, in addition to today, we have uh, four others, and we'll share details with all of you at the end of this webinar. The next one is August the 25th from 12 to 1.30 on parks prescriptions. Um, Tuesday the uh, 15th of September, again, 12 to 1.30 on livable public play spaces. Uh, a third on the um, role of insurance companies and risk reduction on October the 6th. And we're planning a fourth to draw lessons from the Netherlands um, sometime in November. Um, Jonathan's work doesn't come to us in a vacuum. A number of staff and elected officials and other practitioners from the region had the chance to visit some of the projects on which Jonathan has worked in Ludwigsburg and, and Bottrop, Germany. And the impression that everybody came back with was that um, these projects are, are not only practical and uh, reduce heat, but they create incredibly viable public spaces that are uh, accessible to many, many people um, and host a, a whole range of different kinds of events, cultural events, um, and they're just, they're stunning. We feel very lucky that he's donated his time to share with us today. And Jonathan, we just wanna say thank you very, very much. Uh, before you go, just some housekeeping. Uh, this will be recorded so that if you um, have friends that wanted to take part and were unable to, uh, we will share links so that they can view it. Uh, the participants will be in listen-only mode. Um, we are thankful to the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program for the grants that have given us the opportunity to host these webinars. And then finally, um, we want you to be engaged and at the end of this discussion or presentation by Jonathan, we invite you to invite or add your questions, um, whatever they may be, um, into the question box that uh, Corey then will recite back to Jonathan to try to stimulate an engagement. Because what we're interested in mostly is not just exposing you to this really creative, exciting work, but we're in the business of figuring out ways in which this can be applied to Alexandria, Arlington, to Woodbridge, um, Leesburg. We want to make use of these great ideas. So please put down questions that you've got. Um, we have all the way until 1.30, um, so there is plenty of time. And thank you again, Jonathan, for taking this uh, afternoon and sharing with us your work. Thank you very much, Dale. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Jonathan. I'm going to switch over to my screen real quick. I hope that's going to work. Um, there you go. You should be you should be seeing my presentation now. Um, so it's sort of roughly titled around uh, nature-based solutions. So we called it nature-based urban heat island mitigation. And I'm going to bring you a few ideas from Germany, from our work as a company. Um, maybe that's inspiring to you. Maybe that's inspiring for the city makers around your region. Um, I hope I can sort of start a few thoughts, a few processes within your communities. Um, that'd be a great success for me. So I hope you enjoy. And again, as Dale already said, if you have any questions, feel free to post them uh, in the chat so we can work them up later. A quick word about me. Uh, my name is Jonathan. Uh, again, I'm an architect uh, from the southern region of Germany based around Stuttgart. Uh, I work and halfly own the company Helix Plant Systems. Um, and my work focuses around planning and implementing functional NBS. So that's nature-based solutions, uh, in case you haven't heard the term before. Um, we, the company, to give you an, an idea, we, we come from a plant production part. Um, my father owned, uh, started the company a few years back 
and he's a horticulturalist. So um, for us, working together sort of combines everything between architecture and plants. And the result is functioning, working, living walls um, with uh, with plants on buildings. Um, at high season, when it's in se seasonal, we're about 100 people, 100 employees working together. Uh, we have different nurseries all over Germany. Uh, in combination, it's about 18 hectares of outdoor space with seven hectares of glass houses. So it's a fairly big operation. However, there's definitely bigger players in the producing market in Germany. So we're sort of in between uh, sizes. That's sort of the main business that we come from. Um, again, three locations, we produce plants. We specialize in ground covering plants, a lot of ivy, a lot of lavender. Uh, we've been doing that business for quite some time. Again, the company sort of has a startup now, uh, which, is, which I'm mostly involved in. Uh, and we've been doing that for the last 10 years where we go vertically with our plants. So a lot of knowledge in the plant production business really helps us uh, in implementing green walls and also, of course, maintaining green walls. I've, I've started by saying nature-based solutions. Uh, again, if you've heard about it, brilliant. Uh, I do want to roughly sort of not scientifically because I'm definitely far from a scientist. Uh, I want to sort of tell you what is a nature-based solution. And just to show you this chart, the term has been around for quite some time. It started in the 60s when ecosystem design was sort of the name for it. Um, it started with uh, what I think really interesting is uh, it's, it started focusing on ecosystems um, to beneficial to humans. Um, it's kind of got away from that a little bit. So we're now more looking at biodiversities for all sorts of creatures, not only humans. Um, uh, usually, in the early 2000s, it, it was called solutions using nature, but now the term nature-based solutions really combines all the important elements that uh, the work uh, really addresses. Um, in general, it's, 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 the focus is to have more resilient cities, resilience to climate change, to everything our, our urban areas have to start adapting to. So this is kind of is the, you know, I'm gonna mention NBS quite a lot. Um, again, we're, we're not scientists, we're very much hands-on work. Uh, however, we've been, we've been involved in various uh, amounts of, of sort of scientific programs, mostly funded by the European Commission. I wanna mention one because I'm, I'm firstly very proud of being part of it, and it's very interesting work that you might as well benefit from at some point. Um, it's a project, we, it's called Connecting Nature, which we're involved in. We're now in, I think, year three or four out of five. So we're almost almost going towards the end. Um, and the, the project sort of focuses on the sentence, bringing cities to life by bringing life into cities. Um, what that means is that we try to innovate with nature to build those climate resilience uh, in cities. Um, it's coordinated by the Trinity College in Dublin. Um, it's a consortium of a lot of partners all over Europe. Um, just a quick map, I'm not gonna go into who really is involved, but sort of a combination between cities, universities, and small medium enterprises such as us working together um, uh, for five years. There's funding coming from the European Commission uh, that allows us to, to yeah, do research, to do projects, to work on the topic of nature-based solutions in urban areas. Um, there's a lot of people involved. It's a great network because we work with uh, what we call front runner cities, the city of Poznan, Glasgow and Genk. And with these cities, we try out different um, or we mostly work around these cities, but we have a lot of smaller European cities who then benefit from it. So what we call the fast follower cities. Um, and we're trying to establish co-creation processes for nature based solutions. It's by having these three players, so it's universities, SMEs, and cities, you know, you have all the information you need to actually make something happen uh, in certain cities. And hopefully those works get then published uh, and worked around in all of Europe and maybe beyond that. Um, we also try to develop indicators uh, to track impact and effectiveness of nature-based solutions in cities. Um, the universities mostly are focusing on that. What we are very interested and very uh, eager in is developing new business models for financing. Because obviously nobody's gonna work for free and nature-based solutions do cost money, especially in maintenance. Um, I'm gonna cover a bit about that later. 
So us as a company, us as a what we call nature-based enterprise, we're very much interested in finding new business models where we can help our customers, our cities, or whoever wants to implement um, ways to finance those kind of infrastructure areas or whatever it is. Um, replication and scaling up nature-based solutions is, is very much a focus of our project, especially globally. Uh, and that's something why I brought up the whole, the whole Connecting Nature consortium to you today, um, because we're right now very, uh, eagerly working on a platform that you guys can use as well. And um, the idea is there's nature-based enterprises out there like us. Uh, we, in this project, have some sort of an ambassador role, if you want to call it that way. So we try to encourage more nature-based enterprises all over the world to sort of acknowledge the fact um, and present them to communities or to challenges all over the world. So we're coming up with a platform online. It's going to go online at the end of the year, I suppose where you know there's going to be showcases of companies but there's also the opportunities for cities or area regions uh, private companies to post a challenge and then find a company who could uh, maybe have the solution a nature-based solution that is uh, to challenge these kind of things and i'll definitely if you're interested uh, just give me an email and i'll inform you as soon as this goes live uh, because it will definitely be interesting for the northern virginia area as well i suppose maybe that's something you guys can work with as well so that's the kind of work we're uh, we're doing in the project. It's a lot of fun working with other European countries uh, in, and institutions. Um, and part of the project is as well embedding nature-based solutions in city making. And that's that's sort of comes back to why I'm speaking to you today. Why I was invited by Dale and Corey, because um, I'm going to present you a few ideas, a few projects that we've we've done in Germany um, to inspire you or to maybe sort of get an idea on how planning and how process work over here uh, maybe that's something you can adapt if in, in your daily work i have these five projects i want to share with you today uh, don't worry five projects seems a lot uh, i'll mostly cover it by pictures by impressions and tell you a bit about the stories around it uh, if you allow me to first um, something we're very proud of is a, is a noise barrier wall um, we, we got in touch by a city who had a problem. They, the, the entrance of their city, a small city in the Stuttgart region here in South Germany, um, they already had new construction, new housing um, coming up on the one side of the street, uh, and they planned a noise barrier wall, which was made completely out of stone, as you can see on the left here. It's, it's not bad looking, it's nice with the trees on it. Um, however, then the city decided to, on the other side of the street, expand even further and uh, build more houses. Obviously, everybody went crazy when they presented the idea to have a second stone wall and everybody was laughing at it, saying we cannot have our city entrance be covered in two stone walls. That would look ridiculous. Um, so they got in touch with us and asked, hey, do you guys from Helix have uh, a green solution for that? Maybe a nature based solution to sort of take, you know, the focus away from the material that is stone. And we said, yeah, totally. We have the perfect product for it. Um, that's when the planning process begins. So here you can see uh, the street coming into the city. There's a, a, a circle street. Uh, however, um, we knew the new houses are going to be set right next to it. Um, we knew the wall will be somewhere roughly about 100 meters long. Um, that was, you'd think that that all that we have to look at. However, we, we kind of we kind of thought, okay, where does water come from? Water is definitely part, a big part of our work, because as you know, every plant needs water to survive. So we looked a bit further and saw that they, they had plans to build a big supermarket right next to our wall on the other side of the street. So we got in touch with the supermarket owners, the, the construction companies, and asked if we could have all the water that's been collected uh, from their roof. And they obviously said, yeah, sure, we'd have to pay for to get rid of it anyways. We said, it's perfect, plants, Plants love rainwater. They don't necessarily need, uh, are perfectly fine with groundwater, depending on where it is. Um, so we got all that water. We got to store 75 cubic meters of it. Um, it then got a lot more sustainable uh, because we don't have to water it exclusively by groundwater. We can use rainwater. Uh, and then we got to building. Um, it's, it's one of our systems. I'm not going to bore you with, with weird names for German products. Uh, but all our products have one thing in common. Because we have the infrastructure that is nurseries, that is space and the experience of our horticulturalists in our nurseries, we can already plant the plants into our systems 
at our nurseries. They don't have to do that work uh, at the construction site. So we were able to um, prepare everything. Um, we did all the construction around it. And then the day came where we brought the green systems and basically just lifted them in. And this is kind of the, the to, to give you an idea, this is what it looks like as soon as it's implemented at a construction site. So it's already covered in green. It's already covered with shrubs with, in this case, a lot of ivy went on it. Um, and this is what it looks like today. It has pretty much the same features on noise uh, noise cancelling as a stone gabion wall has. However, it looks a lot better. It's it's, it's cooling the, the surrounding areas. And what's most important to me is the fact that on a very small ground surface, we were able to establish a lot of green space. So in numbers, because it's 100 meters long, it's roughly about 50 centimeters uh, wide. Excuse my German. Uh, I don't do any inches or feet, uh, so 50 centimeters might be a bit less than two feet, I suppose. Um, but if you go vertically, you can just expand by a factor of 10. So we put out 557 square meters of green surface at an area where you couldn't have done that if not vertically. There is a bit of science behind it in regards of, of you know, CO2 being binded by the vegetation. On, and oxygen being produced. Um, we did we did do some studies with the University of Dresden, uh, but not on this project itself, but sort of on a on a university side, and then expanded um, those those figures. It's not much, but it does does definitely do more than a stone gabion wall, if you ask me. So yeah, that that already was the first project. Uh, a really fun one. We've. I think that was in 2012, maybe. So it's been around for quite some years. It still looks good. We still do the maintenance, which is a big part of our work. Uh, and only, only in that way, in the sense, we can assure our customers, our clients, that it'll stay green and, and good looking. Um, something a bit more architecturally, maybe. Uh, we have something in our portfolio, which is called the Green Cube in Bielefeld in, in central Germany that I want to talk to you about next. Again, let's go to a planning stage. Let's sort of take a step back. Um, the city of Bielefeld redid a very prominent, very, uh, very central locally uh, space. So they put in like skate parks and outdoor space, trees, really nice place. However, they, they, they wanted to do a bit more. Uh, they wanted to implement a building, which will then house a restaurant or a cafe or any sort of um, accommodation like that. And they, they decided to go a bit to a different direction. So they went to an architect, a local architect, uh, and asked them to design it green, um, which they did. This architect was called Sven Dittering Architects. Um, they did visualizations and planning in green buildings, not knowing, not knowing all too sure how it works. And that's sort of the time when we're being approached, or I'm mostly being approached by architects. They say, hey, we have an idea. We want to build green. Uh, can you help us figure out how we can do it? Um, this is my daily business, basically. And we said, yeah, we can totally build this. We have a system perfectly suited. Um, again, same uh, same process. We already planted in these kind of uh, aluminum uh, boxes in our nursery. We then ship them to the construction site and very easily, actually, as soon as the steel framing is done, we can just lift all these elements uh, onto the facade and to sort of fix them. And it goes very quickly that a building is green if you use these kind of systems and prepare the work already in nurseries. Plants feel better in themselves as well because they have time to, to actually arrive, let's call it, uh, in these kind of boxes. We already put the irrigation system in, so it's a very quick fix once it's on site. And, and for me, the picture on the right is a perfect example of, of of city spaces these days. It's just concrete wherever you look. And uh, nobody wants to spend any time there. But if you then look on the left side of the picture, you can see this kind of picture, the, the kind of the, the, the game, the play between sunlight and shadow and shade. And it's, it's just so much more interesting than a, a hot space in summer, just like these days when it's really burning down. And uh, so they're, 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 they can use their rooftop water as well. They put it into the system, into the irrigation, it then evaporates, cools the surrounding areas. And the cafe then profits and benefits from cooler air, which is naturally sourced, not with ACs. Um, so it, it really makes sense to build green. You have so many advantages from it. Uh, it'll protect your, 
the shell of your building, not in this case because the green is rather far away, as you can see from the actual facade. So it's sort of a facade around the building. Uh, however, nowadays, and this was already built five years ago, um, nowadays the green, I mean, you don't have this light coming through the, the green walls anymore. It's really thick uh, in, in, in ivy. However, that's you know what, what the picture initially was uh, was supposed to look like. So we really achieved that. Everybody's happy. It's still a very prominent space in the city of Bielefeld. Um, you always see some sort of concerts or some sort of events happening around the building. And I'm always very proud to see uh, our work there published. So it's a fun project where we helped uh, the city of Bielefeld to build a green cube in, in their city. Um, again, that was five years ago. Let's, let's look now at a very recent project we did this year. Um, also a noise barrier wall in sorts, different system, a bit of a different approach, but still a very interesting story if you ask me. Um, a smaller town also not too far from where we're located in the south of Germany, they, they have a problem and it usually starts with a problem for us. Sometimes people just need answers, solutions to their problems. And uh, what you can see here is a Google Maps picture of a very prominent street in the city of Reutlingen. Um, and it got some really bad media because uh, the region or the city, they did a lot of testing and had a lot of fine dust problems, a lot of noise pollution because so many cars go by there every day. Um, and the city wanted to put up a noise barrier wall in the midst of these two buildings, right? There's a walkway through it to get to um, a space behind it, but they wanted to cover it up in green. And at, at, at the beginning, I didn't quite understand why they would focus on this area because there's in my opinion, better areas to put green walls up. However, then I went on site, uh, met the, the local planners there, and I saw this box and, and I asked, what, what kind of box is this? And this is how it looked like when I came there. It was a rainy day, really not nice. And the box, they told me then, uh, the county or the region, uh, or the state put up this measuring box. They measure everything you can imagine from fine dust pollution, noise, water, uh, pollution, everything you could think of. And that's why this street is, is, or they get so much pressure from the government to fix the pollution that's happening at that street. That, and they cannot move this box. So they thought, okay, we put green walls right behind it. It will then improve the air quality and have lower measurements on the box. Quite a weird approach, I, I admit. Um, we're about to find out if it makes a difference, which I'm convinced of. Green is definitely going to do more to the surrounding area of this box and of the streets and for the city of Reutling than this really strangely looking building that was there for the last 30 years. Uh, so they tore it down uh, and said, all right, uh, you guys from Helix, this is sort of a rough sketch what we have in mind. Um, there's going to be glass elements to the sides of the buildings and we want to have a big green picture in between. I usually don't get hand-drawn pictures, but I really appreciate that that uh, could definitely work with it. And this is where our work begins, um, basically. So I talked to our gardeners, our horticulturalists. All right, this is what, what kind of plants can we use on there? So we focus mainly what kind of um, direction does the wall face? Is it a north wall? Is it a south-facing wall? How much light will be there? Um, how are the buildings next to it? And then we, we start making a list of plants. Um, that's where we're really good at. That's where I'm really personally bad at because I have no, not as much knowledge of plants as my colleagues do. Um, however, I listen to them and present a picture that we then uh, give the client back. Uh, it has roughly his drawings um, as, a, as a sort of a base. Um, and then he signs it off and that's when we our work actually starts. So what you can see here are panels. Um, they're 60 centimeters by uh, 45 centimeters, so two feet wide. Uh, and those panels, it's a product of ours, Helix Biomuga, and we can plant 16 plants in it. This is kind of what it looks like. Um, so on the left, you can see it's freshly planted plants. And to the right, that's about eight weeks later, I suppose. Um, as soon as as soon as implementation starts, uh, we then ship um, those panels uh, with a sort of a number of, because we really have to know where this panel goes on the wall, obviously, and we ship it to construction sites um, on these trolleys. Uh, there goes there's quite a bit of work involved getting to this point because uh, the steel framing has to go up 
the, the construction, I mean, the, the green is really pretty much the last thing that comes to the wall, but also the most appealing and the, the most fun to look at, obviously. Uh, and this is what a construction site with this system looks like. These panels are really easy to handle. They're not really heavy. It's just two screws and you're off. So this this wall, and we had it doubled because it's on the other side as well, it'll take a, under a day to, to make green. And so the effect is really nice when you, in the morning, walk past the construction site and on your way back from work, it's completely covered with plants. Uh, fun project, um, very happy customer because they they have now a solution for their uh, noise and, and air pollution problem uh, at the site. And this was the look just about two weeks ago. Uh, and in between these pictures, there's two months, right? I mean, obviously right now it's 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 the growing season for plants. It's the summer, everything goes. Um, but this is about the time one of those walls has to get a haircut. Uh, because uh, at some point it's just too thick. And we did that right after I took those pictures. So usually they look a bit more trimmed, um, but it's just so lush looking. It's just so, um, yeah, I think if you if you want to show people green, vertical green spaces, you have to do it right before uh, you, you cut them, you have to cut them back because that's when the effect hits you the most. And this is the situation today. Um, the ugly building has left. Uh, now it's just two green walls in front of each other. Uh, behind the wall in the middle, there's a bit of water fountain, a water feature. So there's cooling elements through the walls, obviously, because we pump a lot of water through it. Um, you can say uh, there's around uh, roughly uh, a cubic a cubic of water every square meter per year that we pump through and that evaporates. Um, so the rest of the water that's too much, we collect back in, in a tank and then redo in the facade. We put um, we can even use the fountain water at the fountain behind this little wall to also uh, water the plants. And yeah, again, we'll see about um, how the air quality is going to improve. Um, I'm quite convinced it will. Um, I hope our client is happy as, as uh, we are with the wall as well. And you can still see this, these paintings he, he drew with his, with his pencils from the beginning. So we really try to implement those. And the wall will will bloom in different times of the season. So we, we, we put a lot of effort in collecting or in putting in the right plants. So throughout the year, you have always a changing image because that's just more fun if you ask me. Right, um, next, I wanna share a story that Dale has already sort of uh, told or already mentioned. It's, it's what we call the green living room uh, in the city of Ludwigsburg. Uh, I have to go back to 2007, 2008 for that, because prior to our uh, European project Connecting Nature that I previously talked about, we had, a, we had another project which goes hand in hand, same sort of roughly same consortium. It was called TURAS, and TURAS stands for Transitioning Towards Urban Resilience and Sustainabilities, also focusing mainly on nature-based solutions and urban areas and how cities can be more resilient over the years. Um, the region of Stuttgart, where we're uh, housed, uh, they're part of the consortium back then as well. Um, and I want to give you a, a few rough facts about the area, just for you to have a better picture, a better understanding uh, of the work we did there. So there's about 2.7 million people living in the area. It's not the most dense populated area in Germany. There's definitely more population in, in Northwestern Germany. However, um, it's, it's a very, very, big car kind of area. So Porsche is located there, Mercedes is located there. And obviously they bring a lot of a lot of other companies with them um, in the car manufacturing business. And there's about 180 communities in this area. So I don't know about the Northern Virginia area, but just maybe scale it up uh, or down, I don't know. Um, and because, because it's they were part of the consortium, they sort of looked at thermal stress in the area. Uh, again, I'm not a scientist. I understand thermal stress is a combination of, of temperature, winds, and sort of on how we as humans experience thermal stress. And uh, 2007 in the present state, so that's a figure a few years back already, um, that was about right, roughly about 9% uh, of the region that had more than, what is it, 35 days of thermal stress every year. And they, they kind of looked ahead and said, okay, how's that going to change? How's that going to be in 100 years? And obviously charts that are very red are very scary. Um, I agree. Um, however, they, they, 
they predicted that that's just going to be more and more and more um, thermal stress. And I think every, I mean, climate change is happening. You experience that in the States as much as we do here in Germany. Um, so it's a big topic and that's why the region really wanted to tackle the problem early being involved in these kind of EU funded projects um, to look at solutions. So there was a call in the region of Stuttgart, if there's any community out of these 180 who would be willing to implement a green wall, who would be willing to bring a bit of funding as well, they will be covered by the EU. However, it needs, it needs resources, it needs people um, to sort of showcase what green walls can do and what noise barrier walls and cooling those green walls can do. And not a lot of feedback came back, surprisingly. However, the city of Ludwigsburg, they said, yes, we'll, we'll, we want to be uh, part of this. We, we, we provide space or, or a challenge, as I said, as we are looking forward into um, the platform. So they presented a challenge that then the consortium could sort of solve, if you may. Um, we were very pleased that it was the city of Ludwigsburg because it's quite, I mean, I'm, I'm at the site in five minutes by bicycle, so it's very close to where we work. Uh, and they presented this area, which is uh, very, very, um, well, it's a town hall square, if you say. It's not the most prominent square in the city. However, this all this area covered here, um, below there's parking garage. So there's no, there's no way you could plant trees or any sort of big green uh, elements on top because it's just underneath it's concrete and there's cars parking. Uh, and they, they said, okay, look, we have this space right next to the town hall center. Um, we could use on, you know, design something, design a green element um, to improve the situation for this square. And that's exactly what happened. Um, with the help of another architect that uh, was in part of the consortium, uh, we designed what we can now call a green living room. So we, a room always obviously has walls. So we designed those in, in kind of Lego bricks. Um, you could do walls, you could do uh, sort of half walls. You could pretty much design a space, um, but shading was important for us too. So we definitely, as you can see in this first sketch, we, we wanted to include um, canopies or something that you, you'd be covered um, by plants when you sit there in the summertime. We, we were very ambitious on what this nature-based solution should and could provide. Uh, we had all sorts of, of ideas. It, it should use it as a reservoir where we can use, again, uh, rooftop water that's there anyways. We want to store it. We want to then use it to irrigate the system. Um, we death dust filter because the area of Stuttgart is so polluted and, and always in very bad news when it comes to fine dust. Uh, so this should very much serve as a dust filter. It should be a habitat not only for us as humans to spend time in, but for animals and obviously plants. Uh, it should provide shade. It should provide cooling on this very hot open space. Um, it should be a quiet place where you can sort of come to, to relax in the middle of the city. And it should be a social meeting point for everybody. Everybody should be welcomed. Everybody can come hang out there, enjoy whatever it has to offer. Um, that was the idea. And well, with a lot of thinking, a lot of designing, a lot of work, that's exactly what we did. So we, we now have this uh, product, uh, Helix Elementa, where Think of, again, as a Lego stone that we already put plants in. So it's, it's about, again, 40 centimeters wide. Um, there's already a substrate and irrigation system included. Uh, we put plants in on both sides. And then you build a wall such as, like, just like you would uh, with Legos. Um, it ended up being exactly the shape that you can see in this, in this first sketch uh, from a few years back. Um, this is the stage, obviously, when it's built, when it's implemented. Um, this was only a year after. These guys really seem to enjoy it. Um, you can still see a bit of the construction. You can still see the steel framing. Uh, however, on the right side, that was two or maybe three years after, that's pretty much gone. And nowadays, it's just a full on jungle. It's crazy. That was, I think it's five years now um, that it's there. Uh, and these chairs that you can see, um, I'm going to go back real quick. Those chairs, um, the city of Ludwigsburg would always put these chairs on the main square. Uh, and every night, every night when they come back to collect those, you know, you, you would have guessed it, they, they find them in the green living room because at the end, it's, it's a perfect example of, of just letting people show you where they want to spend their time. They don't want to spend the time in a, a, hot, um, a hot stone covered square. They want to be in nature. Um, and it's, it's a full on success. The city of Ludwig, Ludwigsburg, they, 
Uh, they run around in all sorts of events, or they used to prior to uh, COVID, obviously, and present them as the green city of Ludwigsburg. They present this object, their green living room, very proudly. Um, so they're having a lot of fun with it. We're, we as a company were very pleased because it's a great, um, great project that we can show off. Um, we take our customers there, present them that vertical green can look like this. Um, a lot of animals, uh, small insects find it their new home. Um, same story on a very small space, especially on a space where there was no way to plant trees. There was no way to plant anything. Um, there's a lot of uh, 140 square meters of green surface now, additional to another 40 uh, square meters of shaded space. And we use around 7,000 7, um, perennials. Um, and yeah, it's, 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 it's living, it's full on working. Uh, this is pretty much what it looks like right now. We put in lavender because we produce them ourselves, so we have a lot of access to them. And so it's great smelling in, in the right times of the year. Um, as Dale mentioned, it's really worth coming, looking, and touching it, feeling it, smelling it. It's a whole different story than those pictures can, can show you. Um, and this, this is a perfect segue to, to the last project I want to show you, uh, because there was um, a bit of money left and a bit of time left in the in the European um, project. So we thought, okay, this is such a great success story of what NBS can look like and be implemented in a city. We, we have to have some sort of mobile idea of this just to showcase, just to sort of drive around and show other cities of how this works. So we again went back to the drawing boards thinking, okay, how, how can we make this? What you can see here on the left, how, how can we make it mobile? Uh, it should also include shading, it should also be cooling the surrounding, it should have living plants, obviously, the living walls, um, seating area. And what came out of it is, is the mobile green living room. It's the same construction, but we didn't put it uh, on, the, on the parking garage, we put it on a steel framing, basically, that every truck uh, can just lift up, uh, as you can see in the picture. Every major community has one of those trucks anyways. Uh, there's a lot of from yeah, from construction sites, uh, they it's it's very easy to sort of push around. We drive up, unload it, and it's there. So it's an instant, smaller version green living room that you can rent in a, in the best case. So the last year of the of the European project Tourus, uh, we said okay, let's drive to all the partner cities in Europe, um, and bring them the living room, bring them part of their work part of the money that the EU has brought, uh, the European Commission has brought into it, yeah, and drive it around. I got to do that in 2016. We built this one sort of trial model of the green living room, the mobile green living room. And, and it was quite the success story for us. Uh, our cities, our partner cities, we approached and said, okay, we bring it to you, uh, you do whatever you want with it. On, on both sides, there's a bit of space where you can write stuff, where you can inform about the project, about tourists, or about a, any any topic that the city themselves um, want to present and share to their communities. Um, and they did all sorts of events around it. They had games, they had concerts on top of it. Uh, I, I couldn't dream of what they used this element with uh, or what they used it for. So that was very pleasing, very surprising and very fun being part of in this trip uh, for a month where this toured around Europe. Um, so it, it, it stopped in Frankfurt for a, climate adaption sort of program where they did a lot more seating and a lot of informing people. Um, we had it in Brussels where they, where it was part of sort of a car free Sunday event where they blocked down the whole city of Brussels and opened it up for bicycles and pedestrians just to, to walk and stroll around and that was the perfect idea for it and, and there was all sorts of stuff happening around it. Um, we, we shipped it to London. Um, which was quite the trip. However, they used it in the outskirts of London to, to inform about, about health, about sports, about better, um, um, better uh, eating. Um, again, it's, there's, no, there's no limit to what you can do with this or what you can use it for. It, it, it's kind of for us an ambassador for more green in the city, for green infrastructure, for green nature-based solutions. And because it's so simple to set up, it's just a thing of 20 minutes and then you need water. Um, that's it. It's very easy. Um, we had, we, I don't even know who these guys are. They weren't part of the conference, the green living room attended. However, they, they took their time to sit down uh, and take a picture uh, wherever that landed. 
Um, we went to Antwerp, we went to Munich, um, always having it uh, locally on the, on the space where everybody can have a bit of it, which was the main idea. Maybe two words about how it works. Um, so where these guys are sitting on, it's basically an open, an open container, an open basin where you can put in about a cubic meters of, of water. Um, there's solar panels on the top, there's irrigation pumps and everything included. So there's no need for cables, no need for any hose. Um, it's just, it's very self-sufficient. Every week or so, maybe now with these high temperatures, you'll have to refill the tank, but that's about it. We do all the monitoring from, from our headquarters here in Stuttgart. It doesn't matter where it stands. If it's somewhere in Europe, we can track it. We can see how much water went through it uh, and we can monitor it and maintain it. So it's very easy for our customers to set up. Um, and what started with a prototype with, with just an idea or the, the result of a, of, a, of a research program has now been become a business model for us as a company. So this one that we shipped around Europe, that was 2016. Nowadays, we produce 22 of those. And those 22, we mostly rent out. A few cities bought them from us, which we don't really encourage because we say, you know, you, you won't use this in the winter, especially not in German winters. So how about you just rent it out for the summer from April to October, for example. Use it in your city, um, we'll take care of it. And then we take it back to our nurseries, um, you know, make sure they get through the winter all right, because we have the knowledge for it, we have the space for it, and then to have it shipped out again next summer. Uh, that's the business model behind it. Obviously, COVID sort of COVID-19 this year kind of put a brakes on it. So we still have a few uh, laying around at our nurseries, which is okay. I mean, obviously it'd be better if they're out there, but obviously those times don't encourage public meeting spots in, in cities. Um, but yeah, it's a great thing. These, these get better over time. A car gets worse over time. These get even better, even richer, even lusher over days, which is really nice. Um, and I want to tell you to the end of this, maybe one more story about what the green living room can do for us as a company and maybe for the community that rented it out. Uh, we, we have approached also a city in the Stuttgart region. For some reason, a lot of Stuttgart region or Stuttgart cities are involved in these green infrastructure, which is great for us because it's short ways. Uh, so the city of Essling had a square right next to their train station. Again, a really open square with no shading, nothing as you can see here. Uh, I, I went there, looked at how people work, how they how they use the space, and what I can tell, they arrive with the train, walk past it in the shaded area, which you can see with the arrows, and then sort of dig into the city. Nobody spends time there. There's a shopping mall on the other side of the square, but that's about it. People run across it. Nobody wants to spend time. So they used to have trees there. However, they had to tear, uh, get them out because of some um environmental issues with the ground i don't know there was oil in it or something um from old industry and the, the the city said hey can we have a green living room we want to put it there can we rent one for the summer we said sure of, co of course we'll bring it over and then it stood there and I, to be honest i wasn't pleased you know i, I I'm, I'm some sort sort of i mean i'm a regular architect but i'm very much interested in city making and, and city planning and i saw this green living room and said that, that can't be it. That's not it. It just looks lost on this big square. Nobody wants to sit there. And the city agreed. They said, OK, what can we do? Um, and, and we really wanted to change the situation there. We wanted to improve it. Um, so again, back to the drawing boards. We took a sort of spin around, or spun around a few ideas. We said, OK, what this green living room needs is, is more green, obviously, and more space to sit. It should be looking like an oasis, an oasis on a very tough and hot square as this one was. And that's basically what our idea was. We should get more green in there. Um, everything very mobile, flexible, easy to handle, quick impact, nothing too fancy, nothing that involves digging up the ground, um, something that we can just ship there, put there, and done. Uh, instant, instant reward, that instant, or the situation should definitely improve as soon as possible and no time for any construction side. Um, so the ideas went from sort of first sketches into, into kind of renderings or Photoshop or whatever you want to call it. We said we need space to sit, more shade through trees or green, and maybe add in second living room just to sort of bundle it all up. Uh, and that's exactly what we did. We I designed uh, a combination of already finished, already 
bought products um, are these these planters and then we did design a few um, wooden uh, furniture for people to climb on to sit on for kids to join or, or play on um, this is what the construction site looked like and this was the day we shipped it out again people went to work one morning it was very early so they ran over the square thinking what are these guys doing you know pushing around containers of plants they went to work and by the time they came back at night you know this is what they found they found a city oasis in a square that nobody used nobody was wanted to stay at i mean why would you it's just too hard um maybe one word about how how imp how we improvise how we work because it had the, the budget was very limited the timeline was very limited uh, we, we found these these boxes where we planted our trees in. Those are used for apple picking. So big apple orchards, they would use just them to put apples in and then ship to manufacturing. We thought they're brilliant. Let's buy a few, put our trees in uh, and shipping out because that's, it's just easy to handle. I think you get the idea. It's an oasis at a square you couldn't spend any time in, like a desert. I mean, that's why we came up with the idea oasis. It goes very, the image goes very well with what an oasis really is. And it's, it's, it worked just brilliantly. That was 2019. Um, when, whenever I went there, you know, there was 10 or 15 people sitting there enjoying the shading. You can see how, how the, there's a play again between sunlight and shadow. And it's just really fun sitting there. And what I thought was very interesting, it's, I, I, I spent an afternoon looking at the people. Who, who actually uses those kind of things? And the answer is everybody. On a Friday night, you'd have partying teenagers there. On a Sunday morning, you have kids playing with their parents on top. Um, there's there's business people uh, waiting for a train. Um, there's lunch, people eating lunch there. It's, it's fantastic. It's for everybody. It's very easy to set up. Um, the city was totally pleased. We were very happy with the results. And I think those pictures kind of speak for themselves. And and for this year, we even took it a bit further because this was published quite a bit. I think Dale even, even checked it out himself. Um, so it, it kind of spread around a bit, which we didn't initially anticipate because uh, we thought it's not a finished product. We, we just built it for the city. But we already had the idea it'd be a perfect contribution to the green living rooms to sort of expand the portfolio a bit. Um, and so this year, we, we kind of said, OK, we should make it even easier. We should have five elements. Uh, a combination of green elements, of, of sleep or laying areas, and sitting benches, kind of blocks. And uh, again, as with the LEGO system, it should be easy to combine. You could make your own thing out of it, uh, easy to handle. And it'd be great if every community designs their own space. Why would I have to design for them? They know their squares better. I mean, obviously, I can travel there and look at it, examine it, and then come up with a solution. But it, wouldn't it be great if the city makers locally could have a, such an easy system that they can then use for their own purposes. And that's exactly what we did. We uh, we now presented just last week to a city the idea of, of these blocks, of, of an amount of blocks they can have from us or that we're going to sell to them. And then, hey, build your own oasis. Is it going to be a very compact solution on a square where everybody comes from every direction? Or is it more of an open space where there's different elements um, do it do it up to you we even we even brought a model to them so they can very easily play with it i mean that's what architects they that's why they always build models because it's just it's it's one thing to have a plan or a picture but it's just a different idea if you have something in your hand and play around with it and yeah the client was very happy with it uh i for me as an architect the greatest achievement would be if they send us back first ideas of their own city of basis uh which then would tell me, okay, this worked perfectly. This is exactly what they wanted. Um, and yeah, we'll see. Maybe next time I'll give a speech, I'll have more pictures of more oasis. So this this could become eventually become sort of a, a part of our portfolio to extend what a mobile green living room can already do. Um, again, a few images of, of last year of the city oasis of Esslingen. It's either sitting in these green, uh, in these green trees or you sit in one of those uh, concrete benches over there uh, in the sunshine decide for yourself yeah so again this this kind of summed up uh five ideas from what we do to tackle urban heat islands uh, what we do with nature what you can do in a very technical way yes uh, it's not as easy as, as just planting a, a shrubs or a tree um but if, if you 
start looking at it in a very creative way, you can do so much with, with green. Uh, and I think we all agree that it's necessary that our cities will have a more of a green approach in urban areas and dense urban areas. Uh, I want to kind of leave you with four words or four, four thoughts um, on what does it take to, or what does it need for implementing nature-based solutions in a successful manner? Maybe it is just, it definitely is just my experience. Um, it needs a lot of planning. Um, it's not something, a product that you can just sell off as you will have on a shelf and ship out and that's it. You have to think of where are we actually putting it? What are the circumstances? Uh, you know, who's involved? It's a lot of planning, especially when it comes to facades. Obviously, there's a lot of talking uh, to architects, to um, uh, customers. Uh, so planning is definitely a big part of what you will have to encounter if you want to implement uh, nature-based solutions. Um, another thing is conversation. I mean, you can tell I've been talking to you for 45 minutes now. I love, I love talking to customers. I love spinning around ideas when it comes to implementing nature-based solutions. I'm very passionate about it. And that's why I think conversation is one of the most important tools to get people involved. You don't want to present them with a finished idea. You want to have a conversation of, of how it's going to look like, how it should look like. Because obviously every customer, every client, every region, every area, every city, it's them who know best what they need and what they can achieve and what their goal is. Um, Nature-based enterprises like us can only deliver the materials or the solutions, but conversation is just crucial to get an idea of, of to get everybody on board. Um, I mentioned it before, financing, major part, uh, all everything that I showed you costs money. Uh, it doesn't only cost investment money, it'll definitely cost you maintenance. Um, only then, if, if only if you have an idea of financing the maintenance part of, of NBS, then you'll have a success story behind it. Because all these projects I showed you, uh, we still do the maintaining of it um, because our knowledge, you know, we know best what our systems need and how we can even improve them or, or maintain their good status. So financing is crucial. That's why we're so passionate about finding new ways of financing nature-based solutions in our EU project. Um, but in the end, it always comes down to people, in my opinion, because who are we doing it for? Yes, we, we try to cool down the local climate. We try to fight uh, urban heat islands. We try to improve uh, quality of life, of air, of everything. However, you know, you do it for the people who live in these areas, who benefit from them the most, and everybody should. Uh, you know, it's on the picture on the left is sort of, yeah, I, I agree with it because it looks beautiful and, and the stores present them in a green fashion, but you know, they want to promote their, their brands. However, you know, everybody should have access to these kind of green spaces. And that's why the buildings I showed you, they're always at public areas, always in a way that people can reach it and spend time there. Um, Cause I think that's important. So it's planning, it's conversation, it's financing, and then it's the people you do it for and with um, you, that you should talk to and always have in mind. And I think that's about it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed these kind of imagery uh, from Germany and of, of what we do. Um, and I'm going to give it back to Corey or Dale uh, to see if we have any questions now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Um, let's see here. We have a number of questions in the chat box. I'm going to read them here. Um, and please feel free to, to add any other questions, just write them in the chat box and I'm gonna read them off to Jonathan here. Okay, uh, the first one I see is, are the plants changed out seasonally on the green wall? Um, we don't change them out. Um, we, we use plants that are good all year long. I mean, it happens that sometimes a few plants die, which is totally normal, every, every garden in your backyard you know you have to change plants on occasion so we we estimate about five percent of the plants are being replaced every year um, but most of them are totally fine going through the winter we we did a lot of testing on which kind of plants to use so we're very we we know quite well what can what's possible what isn't on these kind of systems um, but we wouldn't think it's sustainable if you'd have to replace the, the plants every year and also we look locally so i mean we're not planning on it but if we 
build a green wall in Morocco, for example, we wouldn't use, obviously, you wouldn't use plants that are uh, local to the Stuttgart region. We would have then have our horticulturalists look at plants that are local and re re regional because they work there. But, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the next question I see here is, are there any vendors here in the U.S. that could supply these structures? Uh, well, it's a two-part question. Um, do you know of any vendors here in the U.S.? I know of a few companies that do green walls that we're not involved with, um, but the green wall market is, is spread all over the world. I know Southeast Asia is doing much more than Europe and the States are doing together. I mean, Climate wise, Singapore is, is very constant, so you can do a lot of green walls there. Um, so I know of, of companies in the States, but mostly from sort of media or um, far away. And we haven't had, had any business uh, with the States so far, no. Okay, and the, the second part to this question is, are the plants that are used, are they native to the region? Yeah, that's, that's what I said previously. We tried to only use plants that would grow or are native anyways. Um, sometimes customers ask us to a very specific kind of plant list um, that we try to accommodate as much as possible. Sometimes we just have bad experience with, with some plants that way we convinced them let's not go ahead with that. But native plants and regional plants are definitely something we want to include in our products and projects, yes. Okay. Uh, let's see, the next question I see here is can NBS or nature-based solutions be used to provide noise mitigation in compact downtowns. I'm thinking of noise mitigation for outdoor music venues. I think so, yeah. Um, we use it mostly for streets and car traffic. Um, when it comes to music venues, it's probably a height thing. Um, you know, the wall would have to have some sort of height to prevent noise coming over it. Um, definitely, if you think about regular noise barrier or noise cancelling walls that work, you know green walls will work as well. It's always a bit of a structural issue, you know, there's limitations on how high you can build. Um, however, you could always sort of change a bit of the mechanics, the, the structural ideas behind it to even get more height. Um, so in, it's, it's a general yes, however, we haven't had any experience with music menus. We, we mostly focus on, on car roads and some train train tracks that will always work as well. Okay, uh, let's see, the, the next question I see here, uh, do you believe something like this is beneficial even done on a smaller scale, perhaps a small green wall in a community pool or a recreation center? Again, I'm not an expert, I'm not a scientist. Um, it's just what I believe as a sort of green architect of, I don't know why I called myself a green architect. Um, I think it's it's an if you want to do real good green urban areas, it's a connection of a network. Not one of these projects that I show you um, will will change a city forever. It's just if I think it's a network of green infrastructure elements that will definitely do an improvement. So it's a combination of rooftop gardens, of small interventions, of big green walls, of, of parks, of trees, of uh, green meadows. Um, always think on a bigger scale if you want to actually do a big impact. And every small stepping stone is, is part of the big picture, I'd say. Absolutely. Stepping stones are something that uh, I've been involved with um, through the uh, Northern Virginia Native Plant Project. And the concept behind that is, involves um, creating small stepping stones in uh, suburban areas that connect larger, more intact uh, habitat fragments. Exactly, um, and maybe maybe one more thing to add: the green living room we put on this on this square space in Esslingen, which was totally lost by itself. Just just think about what happened. So the city rented one out one year. The next year they had an oasis, and the next year, you know, who knows what twenty twenty one will bring because they want to get more green into the city and. The green living room, it's just, it's a container sized of, obviously it's not going to change the world. However, it just triggers something in the people. They want more green. People walk past it and say, oh, cool. Is that real? That's one of the questions I get asked the most. Is it, are these real plants? And and the next question is, oh, I want this on my balcony. Can I do it? I say, if your balcony supports eight tons, we can maybe ship it up there. Yeah. 
but I wouldn't recommend it. So, so that's why we're so passionate about it. We, we put this green, more like green living rooms and it'll start a conversation in, in the city. People will talk about it. Maybe people, some people won't like it because they'll say, hey, plant five trees and it'll do a lot more. And I agree, totally. Five trees will definitely do more of an impact. But sometimes, and I presented you those cases, you cannot plant a tree because there's no space. And that's why small interventions like these mobile green living rooms will then open doors in some ways that, I mean, we, we can't think of, but they happen. And, uh, and that's one of the success story about this thing. Uh, that's why we're so passionate about it and keep building more. Absolutely. Okay, the next question I have here um, is specific to the green cube, um, but maybe other uh, solutions that you've illustrated. Um, okay, have you done a cost benefit ratio for the asset owner slash tenant in terms of the en energy savings? Um, and is that a convincing argument for corporations to consider uh, nature based solutions? for saving energy? Um, the green cube, I don't think it would actually make a big difference because the facade is so far away from the actual building. So it's sort of the second facade, two meters apart. So I don't think there's any sort of impact on energy saving. However, um, those the system I, s I showed you with the, the, well, it's a wall planted green system. We, we know that vertical walls will definitely um, save you AC costs. We haven't done a cost or a, a actual calculation, but um, surfaces where there's plants, they cannot heat up as much as, as regular surfaces, as wooden surface or even concrete. So you definitely save energy bias, or, or you try to save and uh, costs um, by reducing your energy bills. However, to this specific question, as soon as we um, finish a project and our maintenance starts, we don't get as much involved with what our client or customers um, does calculation wise. So I don't know about that, but I'm, from from the scientific research I've read about of, about um, about walls and how they they are just cooler by evaporation through those systems, I'm, I'm sure you'll save uh, a ton of money. And and Nick, another idea that you can just think about is um, there's systems that we provide as well where you just have a growing material and you let plants grow up, like ivy or, or vines or anything. And in the summer, they provide shade. So if there's a glass facade behind it, you know, they'll be shaded. But in the winter, they'll lose their, their leaves and you have sunshine coming in. So in the winter, it provides shade and cools your building on a natural way. In the, in the summer, it does. And in the winter, it'll allow light and warmth and energy to come into the glass facade and that has to do a difference i mean i live in a country where acs are probably not as prominently placed as in the states um but I, I, in, without a doubt i think it is but i haven't done any calculations on this okay the next question here is actually more of a comment um but it says green living rooms are a great idea brilliant uh, they, uh, this is from Jean Wright, she says, the possibilities for Bear Street area areas and metro areas are great. So, uh, let's see, I'm going to go to the next question. Have you done any projects that reuse, recycle, repurpose old containers or materials? Um, not so much materials. We're very involved in where water comes from because water is crucial for everything, as you can imagine. Right now, we're, we're doing a, a research project. Um, we have a big major infrastructure construction site in the city of Stuttgart. I think one of the largest, because we, we build a new train station for the city or for the region. Um, and right now, we build a green wall um, right next to one of the containers where the construction workers live and work, uh, live and sleep um, at night times. The research program focuses on blue-gray infrastructure of water. So we use all the water that they use for washing their uh, dishes, washing um, clothing, and showering. Um, not black water, not toilet water, that won't do. But we try to see what happens to our systems, to the plants, if we use these kind of waters. So for us, that's the most important thing to focus on right now. Um, I mean, those panels that you saw, they're made from recycled plastics. 
Um, so that's that's a yes. However, I think water will always be the most interesting resource to look at. Um, in the city of Frankfurt, for example, they already they already having conversations on how to water city trees. Can we can we use uh, um, river water to water it? Because that's going to be a resource in a few years that's very limited, and, and everybody will ask, okay, it's, it looks great, and it's green. How do you water it? And that's why we're very much focusing on research when it comes to reusing water. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, the next question I have here is, have you worked on any green roof projects? And how does the planning vary between vertical and horizontal landscaping? Uh, we used to have a product in our portfolio that are sort of already planted cassettes you could just put on roofs. We've we've stopped working on green roofs because there's uh, bigger and better companies that exclusively focus on that. And we we thought, okay, it's great. We don't have to get involved in that market. Um, we're also on roofs. There's different plants than what you can use on on walls, and we feel much more at home in in, in botanically in you know, plants that go on walls. So we have we have partner companies there, especially in, in southern Germany. There's a few big ones that are very good at that. Um, it, it's different, especially maintaining. There's, you know, there's very much different. There's different ways on how to green a roof. Um, I know fairly little bit about it, extensively or or not. Um, you can do great things, but we we one thing that's really interesting. Cities in Germany they now sort of propose ideas if you if you buy land and build a building on it all the green space you take away from the land you will then have to provide on a roof again uh, and there's even cities that go a step further they say you don't have to give back 100 percent of the land in in green space you have to give back 120 percent so you don't have more roof space that you have ground so you have to go vertically and include vertical facades as well which comes great for us as a company however i think it's also the right step to to cool down urban areas, to go on rooftops uh, and go on facades either way. Absolutely. So the next question here, uh, it's about getting water to the plants on the wall. Um, do you uh, have solar collectors to run the pumps for the watering system? We do on the mobile green living rooms because they should be self-sufficient. I should just place them somewhere and then walk away. Um, we don't on on pro properly built projects. Um, we we leave that to the energy provider or the uh, or the customer or the client if they uh, use uh, solar uh, energy to work their building and their energy. We don't have and uh, we can influence that. Um, we say, dear customer, you have to provide energy obviously to have our irrigation pumps running. Where that energy necessarily comes from is out of our control. But just today. Funny that you asked. Just today, I had a call by a major, major um, energy supplier in northwest Germany. Their main business is gas and, and, and energy, um, and they came to us saying, "Hey, we we get it so much, or we have so many contacts with people building their own houses, and what we want to include, and, and we don't know yet how it's going to work, but we want to include the opportunity to sort of build green or have green walls implemented." So for me, that's crazy to see that energy companies are also catching up on the business saying this should be part of, of construction, this should be part of new residential areas and, and public buildings. Um, so it's it's something that's new for me that energy and, and green walls go together, but something I'm very eager to find out and to maybe expand into. Yeah, yeah and I'd also just like to add that um, Germany, the country of Germany has uh, gets a, a lot more of its energy from renewable sources than the US does. So more than likely the facility the facility that is powering one of these um, uh, green facades or, or green living rooms, they are probably getting their energy from a renewable source. Yeah, yeah. Not only solar, but wind energy mostly. And mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I agree. And yeah. Okay, um, the next question here is, it seems that these suspended plants would need more water than plants that are rooted in the ground. Do you have any sense of potentially how much more water you have to use compared to ground-tied plants? 
Um, that very much varies from what kind of a facade it is, south, north, east, west facade. Something I'll tell you is that um, if you plant plants in the ground, obviously there's a bit of a, of a, of a storage, of more of water storage. One example is that um, for whatever reason, somebody cuts off all the energy supplies and I don't have control over a green facade anymore in monitoring. Uh, a plant that'll be planted in the ground or, or sort of a container that's 50 by 50 centimeters, or two feet by two feet, um, th those plants will do fine for a few days because you know the soil is most likely going to be wet anyway, so there's a bit of a buffer, a bit of buffering in there. On the outer facades that are coming out of the wall, um, you know, days can be very crucial, so we have to act really quickly whenever that happens. So far, it hasn't really happened yet, uh, which I'm very lucky on. Um, but because those plants basically live in a container that's this big, uh, in like a mineral wool surrounding, so they're they're basically like. Um, I don't know, like tomato productions where, where there's no soil anymore. It's just water and nutrition coming from a system, coming from a pump. It's, it's probably not the, the nicest way to put plants to, in, in such an environment or surrounding. Uh, however, it, it works, but it, there's, there's almost no in-between time from when something goes wrong and the time we can react to it. Um, with, with walls that are coming out of the ground, you know, when, when I as a, as a a regular non-horticulturist person see that something's wrong, that's when the mistake probably most likely already happened the week before. Uh, so we already, we, we take much, much work into the maintenance and the monitoring just to ensure that every, everything runs smoothly because reactions ta reaction times uh, on watering are very crucial um, to have to find out when's the right way to act. Yeah. But you cannot, <clears throat> it does need more water, that's true. So it's sort of a constant everyday routine where we pump water through, through our uh, facades. Um, but every project is different. We very, very detailed um, agree on what and how much and when the water will run. Okay. Uh, the next question is um, from uh, actually one of our commissioners at here at NVRC, Victor Angry. Um, he says, thank you for this great presentation. Can you give any advice to county or, or towns that have the opportunity to develop in an undeveloped area, but are receiving a lot of resistance due to many of the citizens not wanting any new developing, every, any new development and solely focused on protecting nature? So in other words, um, there's a, a proposed development in an you know, uh, for new housing or new businesses in a, in a previously undeveloped site um, that's in a natural state, um, what kinds of green or nature-based solutions could be offered that um, um, might appease some of the, the citizens that are, are resistant to the development? I, I wouldn't go as far as uh, looking at a specific system or project product or anything. I think maybe the right approach is participation. Get the people involved. Uh, have open conversations. It, obviously, there's a lot of a lot of resistance, a lot of need for a green or to to keep green. Um, if it's possible, on some sort of level, to work cooperatively and not sort of hate each other and then go on and off. I think participation with the with the locals, with those actually involved by this um, uh, intervention, is the right way to go. And see, find out what is important for them, and maybe go new ways. And and I mean, I showed you a few very uh, different approaches on urban green spaces, and maybe that's something you know nobody has in mind yet because everybody just thinks about trees, which is good. Um, I don't think this is a solution because it's, it's every every time it's different. It's different reasons why people react in a certain way. But I, what German architects in general, not only the green the green um, planners, participation has become a huge method in in German planning processes all over the country because it's so important that everybody feels uh, or doesn't feel overrun by big construction sites and offended by them. So maybe that's something to look into, get get some sort of counseling for participation projects. There's there's definitely people who, are, who only do this and are very good at that. Maybe that's an approach to it. Absolutely. 
Um, let's see, the next question here is from Dan Sklaru, uh one of our um, uh, local uh, professors at George Mason University. Um, okay, the emphasis here has been on green infrastructure. What about blue infrastructure or water features that can be used for evaporative cooling, shaving peak heat, and Dan, I'm sorry, I have no idea what this word is, Uchmizu, <laughs> or yum infrastructure integrating food, like perennial herbs, berries, and or fruit into greening the urban landscape. Um, absolutely. Again, blue infrastructure just as important, and that's what I mean meant by a network of different infrastructures. So blue should definitely be involved as well. As I understood, Dale and Corey, um, Herbert Dreisaitl is going to do the next uh, webinar in this series. He's an ex yes. absolute expert and legend on the topic. Um, so that's a perfect segue to the next webinar. Um, because yes, I know nothing about blue infrastructure besides that we need it for our products. But I completely agree, water fountain, water fountain, water figures, cooling through evaporation by blues, blue spaces is, is great. It's a great place to sort of combine with green infrastructure. I don't also don't know what young uh, infrastructure is. Um, but yeah, for me, it's, it's a combination of both. It's um, a lot to think about. So don't don't say or don't think that all my presentation, all the things we do is going to eventually make a city better. It's so much more to have a really working, uh, sustainable network of, of infrastructures, of nature based uh, infrastructures. And um, we have in our consortium, there's guys working mainly on blue infrastructure. So I sometimes uh, get involved in there. Uh, and yeah, I agree, totally different, but very much as well uh, important for a city. And I think Herbert Reisettle will fill you in with those kind of topics. Yeah, um, I think uh, one one issue that we struggle with in the Northern Virginia region is uh, stormwater. Um, so I think that uh, finding ways to um, use stormwater in a beneficial way would would be you know something that we'd have a lot of fun exploring. Um, okay, so you know you have a good presentation when there are so many questions. So I'm going to go to the next one. Uh, there are limitations about where you can put monitoring stations so that pollutant measurements are representative of the area. Did you consult the agency that installed the monitoring station to make sure the green wall did not make the monitoring station unrepresentative? Um, no, I, I've, I could. Well, it's very political, the topic. So to be honest, I don't quite want to be involved personally. I want to support uh, my customer, which is the city, the city makers, and they definitely do uh, contact um, the organizations. And that's why maybe, I don't know if you meant, if you noticed, but that's why I'm a bit suspicious about the whole situation, planting a wall right next to a measurement station. I, I don't completely agree with it because for me, that's sort of cheating in a way. Um, so I, I have my own opinions about that. I, to be honest, I don't think it's my point and time to get involved in, in that process. However, I am very much interested in the results and if you know it's going to make an imp improvement to this particular situation. Um, it's it's yeah, it's very political in the Stuttgart region. Everything that has to do with fine dust pollution and air pollution in general. So no, to to the answer to the question or to the answer to the question, I haven't gotten involved so far. No. Okay, uh, and then we have another question from one of our commissioners, uh, Libby Garvey. What have you found to be your biggest challenges or barriers? Oh, definitely. I think definitely financing. My my email um, my email inbox is filled with every day with proposals of great green architecture, great green walls, everything you know, great pictures, thousands of square meters of green walls. But then, then you know, financing. I said we can always do that. Uh, have you thought about how you're going to finance the maintenance mainly? Uh, because there, there's, you know, just to drop a figure, green walls go from something about 500 euros a square meters, but they can go up to, I don't know, 2,000 euros a square meters. And that's definitely a lot more than just a regular wooden, wooden cladding on a regular wall. Um, but the last seven years, we've been running around Germany sort of educating people that 
this costs money, this costs proper money, especially in maintaining it. Um, but this has changed. The conversation here in Germany has very much focused on climate change and climate adaption of cities. So the planners, um, they, now, they now know these, these fears, but for investments, nobody really thinks about maintaining. And whenever I do a quotation, I, I sort of start at maintenance, at maintenance. Can we even do it? Can we reach it? Can we get there with our equipment? Uh, and and that's sometimes or that's most of the times that's when when um, clients sort of pull out because it's just it's just not profitable for them. Um, that's why our our bigger biggest projects um, are mostly parking garages. Funny enough, because it's steel framing with the green facade, but you, those costs you can sort of then transmit because the building itself makes money. Uh, everybody who parks there has to pay money, and every square meter you can kind of uh calculate down on a square meter per year per parking and so that's kind of a business model out of it but if if, if a government building wants to green up their wall i mean that's just costs that are there so cost for my maintenancing financing maintenancing is a, is a big issue that sometimes frustrates me but also makes me very optimistic about the eu project that we're involved because that's where we tackle these kind of things what is the need for nature-based enterprises to get more green walls, green projects uh, implemented. Okay, and that leads into uh, this next question um, ha about finance. Uh, would a nature-based enterprise also include use of green banks to finance these resiliency projects in cities? And uh, I guess that's the first part of the question. Um, so if you want to respond to that, there's a follow-up that's um, specific to this area. Um, well, I don't know quite 100% if, if green banks are the same in the States as we in Europe um, understand it. We have The European Commission has a green bank to fund green projects, um, which we haven't tapped in as of today, I think. However, uh, what's been trending in Germany right now is that major cities provide their own funding for their citizens if they build green, they'll get involved by 10% of the cost, for example. Um, and we've we've done projects like that. Um, we've done one in Stuttgart where the city uh, contributed, I think, um, over 15,000 euros to the project. And it's just cash. It's just no, you don't have to give it back. It's just there's just funding happening because the city is want to push and, and eagerly, you know, encourage uh, the companies to. to private owners build more green. And so this is happening and that's that's kind of on a local on a local scale, that's where we tap in with our projects. Uh, and I think that's those budgets are gonna get bigger and bigger as, as we move along uh, in this climate crisis. Uh, and I, I, only, I can only recommend it to my clients and customers to check it out if their city has that. Uh, I can only propose them, they have to acquire it. It doesn't go through the company that implements, but through the owner. Um, so this is happening. I don't know about the States though. Do you know anything about that, Corey, how it's handled in the States? Not really. Um, I think that it would be uh, site specific and project specific. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then there's a follow up uh, question included here that says, are any of these uh, designs being thought of in the Embark redevelopment projects and in LMI communities along Route 1. Um, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I would suggest to the person that asked the question to um, bring these ideas forward to whomever is proposing the redevelopment projects um, and, and certainly um, use Jonathan's examples as something that's been done successfully in Germany. I mean, maybe one example everybody knows about is, for me personally, is the High Line in New York. I mean, who would have thought that a public park that is built on top of train tracks would have such a big result and impact uh, locally for tourism, for the environment, for everything? And just think about, that's, that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you here in this presentation. We just took sort of a creative idea of how could we get it more green? And and for me, the Highland is the perfect uh, example of, of a successful implementation to green infrastructure. It's a nature-based solution at its finest. Uh, I think a lot of you guys know it or have seen it or walked past it. 
Um, it's probably the biggest or bigger or well most well known infrastructure element, and that's that's what I mean. Every new area, every new residential, every new public place, just think how can we green it? And there's there's always going to be a way. It doesn't matter if it's a big structural intervention or if it's just retention space where water can fill up. So that that really is what makes my work the most interesting for me because it's creative ways of implementing green. And that's why, yeah, that's why being an architect comes in perfectly for our company because it it, it just is just right between buildings and plants. Mm -hmm. It's the most fun part of it. So I can only encourage all the city planners and makers um, to think about creative ways to implement green. Yeah, um, and so this next question gets into, um, I know you said you weren't the horticulturalist, you're more of the architect on the team, but what plant characteristics do you look for that predict success in this system and that would be likely to thrive in Northern Virginia? That I don't know. Uh, I don't know much about the climate there. It's been a while since I went there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can only roughly tap it. Um, Obviously, facades are very, you know, especially south facades are very highly tackled by sun. So you have to be resistant when it comes to sunshine, heat. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much as detailed as as it could get with me. Uh, feel free to write me an email. I'll, I'll check it out and I'll I'll, I'll see about the region uh, exactly. But um, on north facades, obviously, we we use plants that don't need much sunlight. I mean, it's just sun and heat, basically, and shadow. Um, mm -hmm. Ivy is a perfect example for a very dark or shaded areas. So it works just perfectly. However, we've also, as the green cube shows, it's purely ivy and it works perfectly as well in sun, sunny areas. Um, we, we even go as far as the picture you see on, on, the, on the, the top, on the down left where they, where they put up one of the systems. We now, we now work with the system in layers. So the first layer, the one closest to the wall, will be ivy and, and sort of very shaded plants because in the summertime you know very prominent flowery plants will go ahead and sort of pass uh, through those ivy plants uh, but by winter when they sort of get small again the ivy comes out because they're very very resistant to to um, to frost and the cold and yeah we use this knowledge to kind of play and plan every wall individually but uh, again i'm not the horticulturist i wish i would know more about plants uh, but I always say that's okay. There's enough people in my company that that know that better than me. <laughs> yeah, and kind of a follow-on question to that is, what options are there for creating green walls that don't require watering systems? That that's going to be difficult. Um, I think vertical walls will exclusively work with watering. Um, it's it's just an environment because of gravity where water won't stay much or stay long. I'm sure there's maybe there's creative ways or creative projects or products of other companies who, who, who sort of work with materials that can store quite a bit of water for quite some time um, that will then be enough by using rainwater or collect rainwater. Um, when it comes vertically, it's very difficult to not have a constant water supply to it, I'm afraid. But I'm, I'm sure there's there's ways to be creative on, on horizontal space where water isn't necessarily as, as prominently featured as on walls, yeah. Okay, we're getting down to some of the last questions. So, um, let's see. Ivy is an invasive plant here, so it would not be a good solution here, but... Um, that's a regional difference. Um, uh, let's see, I look at the pictures and I wonder how much of the maintenance costs. I suppose it depends on the size of the, of the solution. Yeah, and, and the system, it, it, it varies very much. It, you know, it starts from maybe three or four euros um, per square meter per year. Um, depending on the height of the building, depending on the kind of flowers or plants you use, it can go up to, to 20 to 50 euros the square meter per year. Um, every, I'm afraid everything's possible and isn't possible. Um, it, it very much depends on the system itself. Um, yeah. yeah, there's no way to general say, generally say on, on what kind of maintenance costs is. <laughs> okay, so there's another good question. Uh, so we were having some very, very hot days this summer. 
well, the only way to cool off if you don't have an air conditioner is to get wet. Have you thought about incorporating sprinklers for people into your systems? We, we have actually, uh, we, especially on the city oasis, we thought that'd be perfect to have some sort of sprinklers and, and play with water because water is part of an oasis. Um, but very soon we realized it's a health thing. Um, it's not as easy to, to have sprinklers in public space with public water supplies uh, in Germany. Maybe it's a German thing where we're very precise on rules and regulations here. Um, but that kind of went uh, too far for us as a green company to get involved with. Um, if, if it's privately owned, I suppose you can do that. Uh, you can involve, you could put a sprinkler system in it. I know of, of, of uh, other companies with green walls that sprinkle from the front, uh, especially in south, southeastern Asia. You can, in Singapore, I saw green walls where they had like sprinklers to sort of mystify the, the or mist or put mist in the, the air mm -hmm. uh, to have some of the, the, yeah, water on the plants. It's definitely possible. We haven't done it so far, mostly because of the health regulations here in Germany when it comes to public space and water. Okay. Getting, getting towards the end here, um, it seems, okay, somebody wrote, uh, I wonder if there is a way to use porous concrete to make a low maintenance green wall. Yeah, maybe. Um, it has to do with, with weight. Uh, definitely possible. It, you'd have to create a new kind of system. And I know of, of people who work with concrete uh, as a sort of a material to put in plants. It's definitely possible. It won't evaporate as quickly. I could see that happening uh, with our mineral wool system. Water will evaporate quicker because the storage isn't just as much. Um, yeah, I think so. For us, it's sort of a closed system. We pump water into the wall, um, it drains the plants, and any excess water will go back into the wall, we'll collect it, put it back in our tank, and then reuse it. So it's for us, it's a circle. Um, but if you want to store it and hold it in the wall, which our systems don't necessarily need to, um, I think very, or um, how do you call it, the, the concrete? The Porous. Concrete will definitely work. And I, I've seen systems work like that, yeah. Mostly, wow. mostly focused on like privately owned uh, terraces and um, balconies, so where you can stack them and sort of use them on your own, uh, not on like professionally installed green walls like we do. Yeah. Okay, and let's see. Somebody also uh, wrote about uh, the green area ratio. How do you, um, how do those regulations work when? requiring that new construction matches the green area of the original of the original site is it based on leaf area um as far as i know it's it, it doesn't really matter if it's just grass um it'll just say okay here used to be 20 square meters of of, of, of grass um, and then you provide 20 square meters of green space it doesn't matter if it's rooftop gardens uh, or facades in my experience you know that's that's sort of the law in some cases but my working experience prior to to helix as a regular architect is that just too many times people find a way around these kind of laws and regulations uh, i saw buildings which are just perfectly for green roofs and nothing was built there because you know the company built the building you know they were very influential a lot of employees for the city so they kind of worked their way or uh, talked their way out of it um it, it's it's a regulation and law in some parts of Germany, but I haven't seen it have such a big impact. There's there's so much possibility to do green roofs all over Germany. If you go on Google Maps and look at flat roofs, not all of them are green. So it's always a difference between what's actually planned and what actually gets implemented. It's unfortunately not the same amount. Okay. Uh just for the rest of the audience, if you want to learn more about green area ratio, I would um, look to Singapore. They have a, a really cool green area ratio uh, um, policy, and it's incorporated into their biophilic cities policies. Um, and they have some a really cool uh, buildings that incorporate a lot of green. Um, let's see here. I think that... And the district is ratio based on Berlin. What's that? 
The district also has a green area ratio plan that was informed by Berlin. Okay. Washington, D.C. They have a green area ratio plan? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there are a whole lot of uh, comments here saying how much they really liked the presentation, Jonathan. So thank you. We are uh, so thankful that you took some time out of your schedule to share this uh, information with us. Um, we could not be any more inspired by your work. Um, and all of these beautiful pictures and slides. So um, I just want to extend my uh, my thank you on behalf of NVRC. Um, and if there's any other questions, I'm sure um, Jonathan um, has added his contact information here. Um, yeah, get in touch. That'd be great. Okay. Well, thanks we for having me. It's, it's been really fun showing what we do on a daily routine. Um, maybe next time I'll come over and we'll do it in life in person. I don't know. We'll see. This craziness is over. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.